This is a Frontline Club event recorded on the 11th of June 2020. A discussion on China's politics and the economy with Isabel Hilton, Steve Chang and Sharon Chen. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Frontline events. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Palmer. I'll be the moderator today. I'm going to start by welcoming my guests. Isabel Hilton, OBE, a journalist whose fascination with China goes right back to university uh, where she studied Chinese. She remains one of the best known analysts and best respected analysts and writers on modern China, and she's currently the editor of China Dialogue Net. Welcome, Isabel. We Good have Steve, Steve Tsang with us uh, also this afternoon, political scientist, historian, an expert on politics and also governance in China, uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, and peace and security in East Asia overall. He's currently the director of the China Institute at SOAS here in London. Steve, a very warm welcome to you. Hi. And finally, Sharon Chen, who joins us today from China. She is Bloomberg's Beijing bureau chief, and she stayed up late. It's, uh, what, 10 o'clock at night there, Sharon? Thank you very yep. much for that, Just and uh, it's a pleasure to have you in the program. Thank you. Well, this session is called uh, The Great Fall of China, but I think I should add, or is it? Um, China's place in the world is shifting, there's no question. Um, most analysts think it's growing. The coronavirus has shone a brighter light on many of those changes and cast some questions about China's role in the world into very sharp focus and that's what we're here today to explore. I'm going to begin by asking our panelists to give us a, a little precy in a minute or two uh, about some of the most important aspects of this discussion. I'll start with you, Isabel. Go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Elizabeth. It's great to be here. Um, I think one of the questions about the pandemic is, is to what degree it's reinforcing trends that were already in, in train and to what degree it changes things. And I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to answer that exactly, but I'm going to point to some trends that have been um, exacerbated by the pandemic. So internally, China already had some difficulties, problems of internal debt, aging population, concerns about the middle income trap, all of those things which we've been watching for a while, and the need to make a transition from a low added value economy, over-invested, over-dependent on exports, to a, to a higher value consumption-led economy. Now that's going to be harder because uh, post-pandemic you have an economy which is shrinking for the first time in three decades. Persuading people to consume will be difficult and in any event it's difficult in China because households have a much smaller proportion of the economy than in almost any other country in the world. So they're already kind of underprivileged in terms of consumption and getting them to, when they're insecure and a lot of people have lost their jobs, that's going to be harder. Um, and I think that if politically what's changed, well, I think they got a terrible fright in early February, the party did, when we caught a glimpse of how angry people were. And they've recovered a bit, but the cost of, of the recovery has been to some degree ramping up a very aggressive posture externally. So ramping up nationalism to reinforce the story. So now we see being very upfront about how they regard Western democracies as failing, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, moves on Hong Kong, um, cyber warfare of a kind that China traditionally hasn't gone in for, this kind of misinformation um, that the EU was complaining about yesterday. So an important bit of the puzzle of recovery then is what does that external environment do to China's prospects of recovery? Two things I would say there. One, that China's markets have been hit by the pandemic and they will take time to recover. But also politically, it's a uniquely hostile environment now, partly because of China's own actions, you know, over the past three months. And in all the years I've been looking at China, I don't think I recall a time when absolutely everybody is redrawing their policy on China. You know, I'm sure the others get calls all the time from think tanks who are trying to think through what this different world looks like at a time when we know the United States has also gone pretty rogue. The US-China trade war is not going to change, even if Trump loses 
the election in November. It might change in its methodology, but it goes across the aisle. It predates Trump. That kind of systemic competition between the US and China will continue. And all of that, I think, is going to make it much more challenging for China. It's had a very benign external environment for 30 years. It's been on a growth path. That has allowed it to maintain legitimacy at home. All of that is changing and all of that, all of those changes were kind of in train, but they have been magnified by the virus. So I'll, I'll stop there. That's, but I think that's where, that's where we are. Challenging, a challenging uh, time. Steve, what would you add to that? Thank you, Elizabeth. Great pleasure to be here. What I would be focusing on for the next 90 seconds is the wolf warrior diplomacy. What I wanted to say and underline what uh, Isabel has already started saying is that we shouldn't look at wolf uh, warrior diplomacy as something that's primarily about foreign policy and diplomacy. It's primarily about domestic politics. The point that Isabel raised about the sense of insecurity in Xi Jinping and the leadership back in early February, I think hit home really, really hard. And from that, we saw the primary objective of the Chinese government over the period of the pandemic was to seize control over the narrative. More than the issue of public health, more than the economic fallout of it is about controlling the narrative and the primary audience for the narrative is domestic. Because if they cannot convince the general population, they cannot reclaim that credibility and the legitimacy of the party state at the top of which is Xi Jinping. Now we also know, and this is all what Chinese diplomats know, the Chinese leadership admire Putin. They may not think that much about Russia, but they absolutely admire Putin because Putin's style of aggressive diplomacy and misinformation campaign was incredibly successful and Putin gets away with it again and again and again. That's what they want to achieve. And if you have that, then you create an incentive system for Chinese diplomats to behave in the way that we have seen. I mean, we all have dealings with Chinese diplomats over a long period of time. We all know that Chinese diplomats are getting more and more professional, more and more able than previous generations. They are not getting worse. They know perfectly well the effect of the wolf warrior diplomacy, but their audience is not their host government. The primary audience is domestic, particularly one single individual. You get that box ticks, your careers are going to be fine. <laughs> if you don't get that box ticks, that box ticks, and yet you simply were able to do the old fashioned good diplomacy, well, the foreign ministry may appreciate what you have done, but the organization department of the party which has more to do with your long-term overall career may not be quite so appreciative. Now, if that is the case, if I'm right here, that is the point I wanted to end on, is that we will have to expect the direction of travel of Chinese diplomacy to basically continue in the direction it has done. Because that system is being put in place with the incentive system being put in place. And this is something that I think we need to think about and bear in mind. Over to you. Well, thanks very much. Before I go to Sharon, can you just, for our uh, listeners who may not be familiar with the term, can you uh, say in 30 words or less, what is wolf warrior diplomacy? Well, the wolf warrior diplomacy essentially is based on the uh, very popular uh, movie that the Chinese produce called Wolf Warrior One and Two. And essentially it is about a, a Chinese Rambo type of figure who would go around Africa and elsewhere, um, killing all these evil American imperialist racists and delivering gory and 
incredible achievements for Mother China. So if you impose that into the uh, diplomatic world, and you have North Korea diplomacy, who in Xi Jinping's terms, will not be shy to unshield the soul and show what one is capable of for the greatness of Mother China. Got it. <laughs> Sharon, you are watching the economy for Bloomberg very closely indeed. How, how, how would you start out? What would you like to shine a light on? Yeah, so I mean, when I thought about this question, I thought about it more in the sense of the economic recovery and the stimulus efforts. I mean, I think it's really interesting that, you know, China's kind of avoided that kitchen sink, big bazooka stimulus that a lot of major economies have turned to. Um, like the Fed, like the ECB, you know, the PBOC has been quite restrained so far. And actually, I mean, one of the more interesting things that they've done is that they um, announced this program where they're going to use 400 billion yuan to buy kind of loans made um, to small businesses. And it's some people call it something like QE, something like the Main Street program that they're doing in the US. And it's just interesting to see how China's trying to avoid that huge debt buildup and the problems that came with the 2008-2009 stimulus. So I feel like that's one interesting thing to watch how China's trying to navigate this fallout in a more sophisticated way, maybe. And then also it's dealing with this two-speed recovery that all the other economies are also going to deal with as they emerge from lockdown, which is that you know production companies, businesses have come back quite quickly but consumption is lagging and it's very difficult to boost consumption after the, the lockdowns and um, you know, some things are never gonna go back to, the, to before. Consumption habits, um, I'd spent 10 days in Wuhan after the lockdown was lifted and it was really interesting to watch the city come back to life. It was one of the first major cities to do that. Um, so that's one thing, kind of that two-speed recovery and then the stimulus efforts. And then I think, you know, trade and supply chains, obviously, it's so interesting to see how they've been upended. And you increasingly see trade and economics being mixed together with these political fights that China's having, which is, um, you know, something that has sort of been kept separate. But now you see what's happening with Australia, even with the US, you know, the trade deal may come into play. Um, and then the last thing I thought about was climate, it's, you know, China's climate goals being kind of disrupted, interrupted by the virus. Um, you know, people have always painted it as a, as a black and white conflict between growth and environmental protection and the virus kind of made that really stark. But at the same time, I don't think it's so black and white because a lot of the stimulus is green stimulus. Um, but at the same time, you see the virus has definitely put a lot of stuff on the back burner, like the carbon trading platform, the emissions targets, ESG disclosure, stuff like that. So. This is just some of the ways I'm thinking about how the virus has affected economic, the economic recovery. I'd like to talk a little more about uh, trade patterns uh, and politics or uh, changing supply lines and basically uh, taking some of the manufacturing that has powered the economy in China out of China, repatriating jobs, which also fits in with um, political rhetoric like Trump's and so on. What's going to happen? What, what, how, how deep tectonic are these changes going to be? And what's the political fallout? Isabel, do you want to tackle that? Well, it, 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 it will vary. Um, I mean, a certain, going back to the question of how much was already in train, you know, China, China's labor is no longer cheap. The kind of manufacturing that fueled China's first 20, 30 years of growth it has been running out of steam. The whole model has run out of steam. So, you know, you, it's what you do when you have a large rural population who are disciplined, hardworking, can read and write, as China had. You move them into factories, you pay them poorly. Um, and as their standards of living rise, so does the, so does the labor costs and people become less willing to do that. So at the low end of manufacture, you've, you've already got Chinese enterprises setting up elsewhere, actually, to outsource, uh, you know, and then the peripheral countries which have yet to catch up, so Vietnam, Cambodia, where you have, you know, similar conditions on a smaller scale for that kind of thing. Then you've got the more sophisticated industries and you've got, you know, the China price on manufacture for um, 
consumer electronics. So Apple doesn't make its own stuff, it's made in China. You know, you've got, you've got all of those questions, which are far harder, I think, um, to, and will take, and, and have a higher political price. So if you are, you know, a big electronics manufacturer and you want to move out of China, you, you will pay a price in many ways, not least the disruption, finding an, an appropriate location, the fact that China has extremely well organized uh, regional supply chains, which have fed this industry, been built up over many years. So it won't be particularly easy. Um, I think that you can see some American companies trying to appease Donald Trump, if you like, by setting up a manufacturing plant somewhere in the States. That's not necessarily going to do the big substitution. In certain sectors, like pharmaceuticals, I think we've now got a security element in that. And then you've got a further complication, which is um, the United States putting certain Chinese manufacturers on the entity list because supply chains go both, go both ways. China's electronics big giants use chips from US firms. And if they get put on the entity list, then they have a, a supply problem. So it's a very complicated picture. And, and you know, uncoupling globalization or de, you know, decoupling is easy to talk about, but immensely complicated, time consuming and expensive to do. So I think it'll be confined to uh, kind of low hanging fruit um, mm. and, and things that are relatively simple. Could I just say something about um, Sharon's very interesting comments on climate goals and, and the recovery? Because um, I, I completely agree that, I mean, in 2008, they essentially threw a shed load of money at concrete and steel and they built stuff. And that's a very problematic model, particularly now. It doesn't work anymore for a start. You get, you get less bang for your buck or almost no bang for your buck. And, and China's overbuilt in infrastructure. So it's, it's kind of pointless. Um, th there is a whole, there is a, a, a high level strategy um, which is called ecological civilization, much embraced by Xi Jinping. And that's the vision that China will in 10 to 15 years become green, beautiful, capitalize on low carbon goods and services for a carbon constrained world, make a virtue out of the demands of climate change, if you like. So that's built into China's industrial strategy. What's worrying us at the moment is the degree to which that has been knocked off balance by the pandemic and the degree to which, for example, building new coal has come back onto the agenda, which in climate terms is a disaster. Uh, but it is now, it would appear that the next five year plan, which is going to start at the end of this year, could incorporate new coal at a time when, you know, China's coal plants are already running at 35, 40% capacity and there really is no need for it. So it's very, very mixed picture. There's, there is a green recovery bit, but there's also a whoops, how did coal get back in there bit? And, you know, that's these, both these things are happening. I totally agree. Um, Go ahead. Yep. I was just going to say the state council just released a plan for boosting oil and gas um, production in the Western regions, actually in, in Xinjiang as well. Um, you know, it's all part of this energy security that Xi Jinping is pushing now. And it's all tied in because it's the geopolitical tensions that have now become even worse after the virus. That's prompting even more emphasis on this energy security having its own supply of energy. So even though, um, you know, China is investing in green energy, it's kind of because it's, it's very palatable and it's very popular, but if you don't take the carbon out, then you're not really making a difference. Exactly. Yeah. Steve, uh, the, given that the, there are geopolitical tensions rising, China's uh, will have economic problems, coupled with the wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, we're going to hear a lot of aggressive rhetoric. Are, does that raise the possibility, probability, of some kind of armed conflict or military confrontations or even proxy wars in the world? Not immediately. I think for all the tensions we are seeing between China and the rest of the world, for which mostly we are referring to the West, such as it is, the West is not going to do anything proactively that will be uh, militarily threatening to China. There's no reason to. 
not not even the Trump administration is not going to be uh, doing that. And operations like your freedom of navigation operations in South China Sea is not really uh, a particularly aggressive operation. The Chinese government mm -hmm. used to see it the aggressive American deployment, but really nobody else will see that. Even the Chinese actually do realize that under international law, the Americans are within their rights to do so. And that also in fact includes uh, American ships sailing through the Taiwan Strait. They are what high, high seas. <laughs> There's nothing wrong for them to be, to, for US ships to sail through them. Um, you can see that as being uh, provocative from the Chinese perspective. But this has been happening even before all this. So I don't see any of these uh, as something that will escalate into a military confrontation. Now, where there are going to be problems, we are going to be seeing, first of all, Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong is going to be a very, very big issue in the next 12 to 24 months. But again, the reality is that whatever happens in Hong Kong, it is not going to escalate in a way that will involve the deployment of security forces by the Western countries. And then beyond Hong Kong, you have Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Taiwan is the really big deal. Um, it is the one scenario that uh, the Chinese government has made very clear. It will use force if it feels that it has no other options in getting Taiwan to do what Beijing wants Taiwan does. It, that's really a question of when Beijing choose to draw that conclusion. Because again, we are not going to see any government in Taipei uh, declaring independence. Tai Taiwan's position has always been that uh, Taiwan does not need to declare independence because Taiwan is already independent. So we, you don't declare independence when you already are. And I, again, we don't see that provocation from the other side, but the Chinese government can choose to take actions if and when the Chinese government feels that they have the military capability to do so at the moment. So you think it's a question of, of when, not if, as far as you're concerned? Yes, but the when, we are not talking about five, ten years. It will be longer time frame than that. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, we've got a question here specifically for you um, from Dana Gutierrez. Distancing rules highly visible and enforced in Wuhan? Um, when I went there, it was just when they were lifting the lockdown. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was crazy. Like everyone was distanced, you know, you needed a health code. They have it on Alipay and WeChat to get into any building, any public transport. Um, you had to you, what, show your phone or how did it work? So you have to scan this QR code and then it says, um, if you've been in contact with anyone who tested positive, if you um, have traveled to a high risk area in the last 14 days, and if your coat turns yellow, you're supposed to be quarantined. And if your coat turns red, you're supposed to be like in a hospital because you tested positive. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was a lot of policing everywhere. Um, you know, I got the sense that people were more afraid of being locked up again, locked down again, than they were of actually getting the virus. Because it was actually quite safe in terms of the virus because, um, you know, the hospitals had treated so many people. Like if you had gotten sick, I think the doctors there had a lot of experience handling it. Um, and they were doing a lot of mass testing. When we went there, they were like, we walked past this company that was testing 2,000 employees in one day. They were just standing outside and getting tested. So I think it wasn't so much about the virus, but it was more about, um, the psychological impact of everyone just being very wary of each other. Um, the restaurants technically open, but nobody was eating out. The malls mm -hmm. were empty. Like people were just getting in their cars and going to work, basically. And how's that changed? Do you have any sense of how, how it's, uh, people have relaxed a bit? I mean, I haven't gone back, but I get the sense that they have relaxed. And, and in Beijing, it's like basically back to normal. Like I've stopped wearing a mask. You're not, yeah. You don't have to anymore. Wow. One new case today, though, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Near, our, near our office, actually. <laughs> really? 
Now, um, here's a question that you can all share, and it's from Manuel Langendorf. And he says, in what ways um, how, have the, the recent events, and I think we can probably uh, count Trump's rhetoric in there as well as the coronavirus, impacted China's plans for the Belt and Road Initiative? And uh, he's also asking maybe for you to discuss uh, the prospects for digital connectivity companies like Huawei and ZTE. Can you, uh, who'd like to take a run at that? I can start on that if you like. Um, yeah. Again, Belt and Road, um, you know, if you compare the second Belt and Road Summit with the first, um, the first one is all oh, whoopee, you know, we're going to get out and do this. And the second one, there'd already been, there were already problems that were beginning to accumulate. So there are problems on the Belt and Road. Um, and and the problems are less important when you have very very large amounts of money to spend that's no longer true of china china doesn't have pockets as deep as it did so what are the problems well there's a question of of who pays and how they how these projects are paid for and whether they deliver value so when the japanese tried to do this kind of thing in the mid 90s being in very much the same kind of with the same set of problems that china has now but being Japan and not China, they found that, the, that one of the difficulties was finding valid infrastructure projects that really paid for themselves. Because the model is that China's financing these, but it's financing it, them through loans, which are not particularly cheap, to the host countries. So if the host countries find that the infrastructure project doesn't, doesn't deliver value, doesn't generate revenue, they can't pay back the loans. Now you can that's that's okay when you know the tide is in as it were but when the tide goes out everybody goes whoops you know we can't afford this um and so so that will start happening and so china's going to be faced with a great deal of renegotiation of debt something that china hasn't had to do externally ever and the question is how does china handle that because again there'll be domestic pressures saying well that's you know that the chinese taxpayer as it were saying well that's my money why why are we losing it abroad when when you know there are lots of poor people here and lots of needs here that are not being met that's one set of problems um there are other problems to do with you know what what these projects are and they are very overwhelmingly energy projects and of those energy projects overwhelming again high carbon so if you're trying to present yourself as china is as a kind of green warrior there is a problem about building new coal <laughs> along the belt and road or you know other high carbon investments um, and then there's been there have been some past difficulties which are related to debt and the ability to pay and the fact that some of these projects are really pointless and the most famous one is a port in Sri Lanka in Hambantoto which uh, Sri Lanka simply couldn't afford to pay for it was almost unused and China took it over on a 99 year lease in a kind of asset for debt swap slightly reminiscent oddly enough of hong kong you know kind of 99 year lease extraterritorial concessions you know not very popular and not a great look for a country that is presenting itself as an alternative development actor part of china's story now is these western democracies they are failing look at us look how well we've done you can do this too allow us to you know lead you along this this development path and um you know that's running into trouble so we'll see and whether that will lead to there is already a digital silk road by the way um so it's not new um part of the great cosmic battle between china and the united states is who sets the rules who owns the patents whose standards apply to the digital future and that's the huawei zte uh, argument and that is where where china is very very keen for as many countries as possible to adopt Huawei as their 5G. And that's the battle still being fought. Yeah, and, and the, the battle lines are shifting, I think. Steve, you want to pick up and add something? Not hugely. I think I would want to underline what uh, Isabel, where Isabel ended with the Huawei and SETI uh, involvement. I think there is, a, there is a stomach in Beijing to push hard on that. I mean, the, the more that uh, Huawei may potentially be facing more pushback in Europe beyond America, uh, give them even stronger incentive 
to push and enable Huawei to stay as a globally competitive company, if not in Europe, at least elsewhere in the rest of the world. And therefore, the Bell and Road framework would fit in quite well from that uh, perspective. Now, whether it will work or not, I think that's a different issue, because there we are looking at not only the issue of uh, Chinese government commitment and support, we are also looking at whether Huawei can get the critical uh, supplies, and a good part of them at the moment still come from U.S. companies. And if those mm. stop going, it will cause some problems for Huawei. And they are looking; they're working very, very hard to get replacements for them um, from domestic sources. Mm. But that sort of thing usually take longer than I think uh, allowed for. So mm. I don't. I don't know whether that is a foregone conclusion. The other th point I want to, to, to add is that the Hanban Tota thing would have left a very bitter taste in Sri Lanka and is a warning that many countries look at, but it's a one-off. Mm. Um, the, the, the Chinese are learning from that lesson. They do realize that they really had done very badly with Hanban Tota and they are trying to um, avoid me repeating, repeating the same mistake elsewhere. So I would expect that them to do a lot more renegotiation of existing debts than rush in and take over facilities that mm. uh, will, will leave them in, in a very bad name. We've got a little follow-up question for you from your remarks on Taiwan here from Luke Douglas Holm, who wants to know, why don't you think the Chinese will move in Taiwan for five to ten years? Why will it be more doable then than now? Uh, the main reason is a matter of capabilities. The Chinese do not have the military capabilities to uh, attack Taiwan. And you get into the funny situations that very recently you have one of the Air Force Major Generals, recently, relatively recently retired Air Force Major Generals, who previously was known as a bit of a hawk on Taiwan, coming out to say that, well, really there's no need for us to rush into this. Uh, we can sort out Taiwan in in a good time, in a time of our own choosing, no need to rush. Now, I think the reality is that she, the party state and the civilian leadership clearly wants to get Taiwan sooner but, rather than later from their perspective. The people who have to actually get the job done, the high command in the POA, the uniform officers, they really are very uncomfortable about it because they are the one who needs to do it and they know they can't do it. <laughs> but if you are in active service in the PLA, you do not say no when Chief Commander in Chief Xi Jinping asks you a question. You only ask, How would you like it to be done, sir? Right. And the only way that you can get somebody else to say no is to get some of your other your colleagues who are already out of service, hence, your recently retired Major Air Force, a Major General in the Air Force, being mobilized to come out and explain a view that I suspect a more uniform active service officers share, but would not dare to say. It's tempting to think, think of the parallels with... States. Sorry, I just think that's also true of the United States military, but, but mm -hmm. one of the problems is, I mean, there's, there's, there's attacking and occupying Taiwan, but the occupation of Taiwan is, is the really, really problematic. What do you do? You know, you, you're a hostile occupying power. And as we know from recent history, that tends not to be short or pleasant. Uh, it, it rarely turns out well. Yeah. Um, I have a playful question, or at least a, a detailed question for Sharon from Roger Macy, and then a more serious one that maybe we can toss around for a bit. First of all, Roger says, aren't there any old people or older people in China without phones so, so they don't have QR codes to be able to get around? <laughs> Well, actually, you can get a physical health code from your neighborhood committee. So you can go to the office and they look at your documents and they look at if you've traveled and they give you a piece of paper. Um, you know, I mean, the health code thing, I think, has been reported in the West, in the media, in the foreign media, in a very dramatic way, um, like a big surveillance mechanism. And I think that a lot of surveillance initiatives in China are reported that way, but people forget how logistically difficult it is to pull it off. And oftentimes it's not, um, you know, this crazy big brother thing. I mean, they want it to be, it's just very difficult to execute that for a billion people. Like the social credit system, I mean, it's like 
very overhyped. And, and with the health code system, I mean, each province has their own. So like I have one for Beijing and then if I go to Wuhan, I have one in Wuhan. And if I go to Shanghai, I have a different one there. And they all have different criteria and they're all run differently and all run by different systems. So, um, I mean, there are definitely a lot of people who fall through the cracks and, you know, it's not, um, it's not foolproof. Like it's not perfect. It's not like if you walk through a gate into a shopping mall, they definitely know if you've been somewhere at the end of the day, it's people physically looking at someone's phone. You can just screenshot someone else's health code. You can just, you know, I mean, oh. it's not, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just not like that very high tech idea that I think a lot of people have of it. Uh-huh. I, I guess that's reassuring. <laughs> uh, so we've got an interesting question here from Anonymous, um, uh, who brings up the question of the DCEP, which I gather is a digital currency. And the question is, can you discuss a little bit how this Chinese digital currency fits into the whole idea of development and competition and the economy and certainly rivalry with the United States. Sharon, do you want to start out with that? Have you thought about that somewhat? Um, not a whole lot. I mean, you mean the digital currency that the PBOC is trying to, is piloting, yes. right? I think so. I, mean, I, I see th Isabel nodding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't really know that much about it. So we don't really know how it's going to play out. Um, I mean, I do think that it is a way that China is trying to um, you know, come out ahead and trying to establish a system that um, will be used within the country and everyone will use it, I suppose. Um, but I mean, to be honest, I don't really know that much about it. And it, it, there hasn't really been that much detail. I saw you nodding um, there, Isabel. Do you want to pick up? Uh, well, I, with some trepidation, since I am not an economist. Um, I, but I think it relates to the difficulty that uh, China has over internationalization of the renminbi. Um, you know, China would like to have the renminbi as an international currency, but it can't because well, for reasons that any economist understands, I won't go into, but it would have to have a much more open economy and, and uh, it doesn't want to do that. Um, so it's stuck with the dollar. And, um, and this, I think is a, is a kind of, it's partly an experiment in the future in digital currencies and China is becoming very rapidly a cashless society, actually. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's astonishing uh, how quickly that happened. But this is also, I think, an experiment to see whether international transactions could be denominated this way, thus kind of slightly sidestepping the dollarization question or the mm -hmm. internationalization of the renminbi question. I'm going to stop there before I say something okay. really stupid ton of mail saying. <laughs> it sounds kind of nascent. It's probably something we can come back to in a few years and either see whether it was stillborn or, or actually gathering steam. And yes, I, I was in China myself uh, almost exactly a year ago and I was staggered to see kids uh, at the I did some cafe in Beijing buying um, ice lollies with their phones. That, that brought it home to me that this truly is practically a cashless society. Yeah. Um, so this is a question for Professor Tang. Can you expand on the question of Hong Kong as a potential trigger for conflict? What are, how could it go pear-shaped? That's from Louisa Chan Boigli. What we have in Hong Kong is a Chinese government determines to get its way and put an end to people in Hong Kong protesting or otherwise articulating from their perspective, these loyal thoughts in Hong Kong, particularly on the streets or on campuses. And they are doing so by imposing a law to be passed by the National People's Congress Standing Committee on national security. Now, there is nothing fundamentally wrong with the Chinese government insisting that Hong Kong must pass a state security law that is provided for in Hong Kong's basic law under its Article 23. Um, it's politically very, very difficult to do. You will, it will face enormous amount of resistance in Hong Kong, which is why the Chinese government decided to simply bypass it, bypass the Legislative Council, bypass the Hong Kong government, just impose it. 
The problem there is that when that is being done, it's no longer a matter of the substance of the law and how repressive the provisions of the law is. It's the simple fact that bypassing the Legislative Council cannot be disguised as not violating or ignoring the basic law and the sino British Agreement of 1984, which um, essentially give rise to the basic laws of this is what is triggering the strong reactions from the uh, Five Eye countries, and particularly from the United States, which has already openly said that it can no longer justify Hong Kong being given special status under the Hong Kong Policy Act and the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. So the US government will, at some stage, have to uh, respond to this change in Hong Kong. And it's very difficult to see Xi Jinping standing, uh, easing off on Hong Kong, because this is something that he decided to do. And that's why he changed the key ministerial level cadres responsible for Hong Kong affairs back in January and February. Two of them were changed in January and February. Huh. So we are a bit locking into a situation where you will have the US administration and the Chinese government both taking a hard line on Hong Kong. And that could potentially result in escalation of what the other side will do. If the Trump administration come up with something pretty uh, stiff on Hong Kong, uh, it will, it's unlikely to be aimed at Hong Kong as such. It's more likely to be something like perhaps applying the Global Meninsky Act uh, to Chinese officials and senior people who are responsible for Hong Kong matters. Mm -hmm. Now, if that happens, then you're going to see a Chinese government having to respond, escalating. So we have a, a question that builds on that from Duncan Barlett, who points out that banks like Standard Charter and HSBC have said they're going to fall into line. They've, they basically issued a statement of support for the new security laws. Um, that's going to get them uh, a lot of uh, political criticism and maybe customers pulling their money. Why did they do it? And how does it strengthen the Chinese government's uh, position? Sharon, do you want to pick up on that? I mean, I think they didn't really have a choice, right? I think they they just know, they just understand that it's just untenable for them to do that. But I think it's really interesting. There's good. I mean, we already see pushback from employees, which was which is interesting. I mean, you know, obviously we've been seeing that in the U.S. Facebook being a very prominent example of. Um, you know, employees disagreeing with the political stances that their companies are taking. And it's obviously an unpopular move in Hong Kong and they have UK, UK politicians have also pushed back against it. But I kind of don't really see what the executives can really do about it unless they, I don't know, maybe I'm just cynical, but I just feel like companies are not really going to take a, <laughs> a, a stance based a on principled stance. Yeah, you know, at the end of I don't know. I don't know what you think about that, Isabel. Well, I just they feel do like ninety percent of their business in in Asia, if not in China. And um, I mean, in HSBC's case, they were already quite unpopular with the demonstrators because they had um, they closed some accounts which were taking money in to you know get people out of jail and help help demonstrators in Hong Kong. So they they were already kind of on that side of the line. Um, but uh, Si Wai Leung, who's the, a, a previous um, Hong Kong CEO, chief executive, as they call them, um, so one of Carrie Lam's predecessors, kind of explicitly threatened HSBC. He, he, he wrote a, a blog which said, you know, don't forget which side your bread's buttered on. Don't, he said, reminded HSBC of the special privileges it enjoys in Hong Kong, I think were his exact words, and don't count on them continuing. You know, so, <laughs> I mean, right. that's explicit. And this man is, um, he's no longer chief executive in Hong Kong, but he's a, a, a player in a thing called the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which is one of the, you know, kind of symbolic political bodies. So he's, he's, not speaking for himself, shall we say, you know. Um, so so what's the what's bank to do? Um, it's tough. It's really mm. tough. And there yeah. will be some 
they'll 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 there'll be some people who will withdraw accounts, but but essentially their money, you know, their kind of operating profit doesn't come from retail customers so much as from you know big investments and big business. And they can't do that without China. They also print, they they're they're one of the three banks that prints Hong Kong's currency. So that's one of their privileges. You know. It's quite easy to see how they could be pressured. Do you think there's any way that external pressure could tip the scale? Because I don't really see, you know, even pressure from the public or pressure from the UK or pressure from the international community. On the bank. Yeah. Maybe. No. I mean, I think the weight of business is such. Um, I, now, Hong, HSBC moved its headquarters to London. And did it move back again? I can't remember. It's so there could be... Right. I, but, you know, the business is still uh, so much in Asia that I think it's very, it, it just makes life more uncomfortable, but I don't think it would change the posture. What are mm. they to say? We disapprove. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. The, the thing we need to be bear in mind about the, that particular story is that we shouldn't focus too much on what HSBC or Standard Charters are doing. Um, what is interesting about it is that the Chinese government has now made it very clear that its approach to the international business community is that you are with us or you are against us. And other companies will start to have to think about and prepare for that moving forward. So they may be very successful in getting the companies which are very, very heavily in, uh, invested in China and have no op no other options to uh, toe the line. But in that further down the line, they may well have to pay a price for this short-term success. It's not going to be immediate, it's going to be profits. But companies in the long-term planning also think about the kind of risk that they face And when that happens, and the and indeed the Tiananmen activists in concern were in the states. Uh, so so this why then <laughs> was this a problem? Uh, Zoom routes its its calls through. China, that I think it, it has a, a kind of technical connection in China, um, but it it's very, very problematic. Um, I mean, we've seen versions of this um, with uh, Google, for example, when, when Google was still in China and uh, the Chinese asked them to censor results and they were delivering different results in China from results outside and then they got booted out anyway. So you know, this again, is a long, it's a long story. But I think this is pretty bad for Zoom, actually. I think that this is really, well, you know, just at the moment when everybody is using Zoom, including us, yeah. you have flagged up that, uh, that you are beholden in a fairly major way to the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. uh, not yeah, I mean, I think from the company's point of view, it's like we're in this state of heightened sensitivity over this issue in the first place. And it just seems like such an obvious um, concession to China to do that. Own so I don't, goal, as the British might Yeah, say. I mean, I don't really, like I agree with Isabel, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like it seems yeah. like the backlash would outweigh kind of- they, So we may see some retreat avoided, from Zoom yeah. in, in the days to come. Yeah. yeah, I mean, its stock has been going insane, so I feel like <laughs> this is not going to do with A well. <laughs> We've got a question from the United States here from Albert Golson, and he's asking about the Chinese COVID vaccine. There are several in development there. He's asking how damaging would it be to China's global reputation if they won the race to deliver uh, a successful vaccine? Um, or, or finds itself probably among several international vaccines available, and the rest of the world just rejects the Chinese vaccine because it's Chinese. Steve, do you want to take a run at that? Sure. 
Well, first of all, I think the assumption may not necessarily be valid. Uh, if the Chinese do develop a vaccine that is clearly more effective than anybody else, and it is going through all the normal uh, approval procedures, I suspect that we will actually use it. I mean, I don't, I don't think we will necessarily not use it for political Happen, should happen uh, for obvious reasons, but it will not necessarily be that harmful to the Chinese government in the short term. It's a bit like the backlash against the wolf warrior diplomacy. We all see the backlash. We all thought that how much damage the Chinese have done to themselves. Is, does, does it worry the Chinese government? Not in the slightest. Not in the slightest because it gives the government all the ammunition it needs to work up the nationalism, to get the peoples to rally around the flag, support the Communist Party, and see that it is a very hostile world, which are fundamentally anti-Chinese and racist. And the only way that you, good Chinese people, can have any chance of standing tall is that you embrace and support and love and admire the leadership of the Communist Party under the wise guardians of Xi Jinping. So it's a price that I think if, if they have to pay, they can pay and take advantage of. But obviously they would prefer not to see that happen. Um, also, I think it is unlikely that if the Chinese did come up with a vaccine that went through um, you know, the third stage trials because and that it would still be rejected by the international community if it proved to be effective because the third phase has to be carried out in a country that has an outbreak so china's going to have to carry that out in another country and like can sign was already like signed an agreement to do that in canada um so i think that they are also aware of this risk and seeking out kind of more quote unquote reputable developed countries in which to do the third um, stage trials and kind of gives it a bit more legitimacy and I think if they are able to prove its effectiveness um, at that level I think it would be hard for governments to argue that they sh their citizens shouldn't get the vaccine if it's no but I would pro I, it probably that, that, that China has a tremendous opportunity were that to be the case uh, depending on the conditions under which it offered the vaccine to the rest of the world. And, you know, I, there's a huge potential soft power win here if China were to say, here's our vaccine world, you know, help yourself um, or, you know, allow manufacturing elsewhere. Because people will be thinking, hang on, pharmaceutical dependency, you know, nervous. China with the, as the only source of a vaccine, you know, represents risk. China can turn that around by, by just giving it away or giving the, the rights to manufacture it away, were it to be, uh, were we to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, here is a great big crucial question uh, from Alan Babington Smith. Uh, how ready is China to fill the role in international leadership abandoned by the United States? Um, China would like to be uh, to have a, a, a global leadership role, but not that one. I um, mean, I think we've seen. I think we've seen the last. I mean, I've never seen anyone make a mess such a mess of an open goal as the last you know, year in China. China doesn't want to be the global policeman. It doesn't want to, you know, carry the can. It wants. It has a completely different notion of what global leadership looks like. And yes, it, it is explicitly ambitious to be, you know, number one in the world. But it wouldn't look like the United States hegemony. Um, so it's, it's kind of advancing on a lot of different fronts. It's trying to change multilateral institutions. It's setting up its own multilateral institutions. It's trying to paralyze those that it can't control. Um, and it's presenting itself as a model. Um, but that isn't the same as, uh, that's, not the, that's not the American model. I would so agree. What do you think about that? I, I would agree. I would, I would agree with um, Isabel. The Chinese are not ready and willing to take on that role. 
um, even though I, where I would slightly disagree is that I don't think they would ever look at doing it the way the Americans had done it anyway. But even then, there is something inherent in being the top dog globally. It has an enormous price to pay in terms of uh, being dragged into all kinds of geographical and other conflicts that they don't really have an interest in and don't want to be involved in. And they need to be paying, signing off big checks left, right and center on all sorts of things. They are not willing to do that, uh, not for quite a while yet. And in fact, it is also very difficult for them to afford. For all the talks about money rolling in and rolling out in China, um, it is still not a genuinely wealthy country that can afford to pay for all those. I mean, the way how they manage um, Baron Row and try to pretend that it is comparable to the Marshall Plan and confuse everybody over that when it was blatantly obvious Baron Road is everything that Marshall Plan was not. Marshall Plan was something that give donations to countries to develop, which can become competitors to the donor country. Mm -hmm. Baron Road does not do anything like that. Overwhelming majority of the projects are loans which the Chinese government expect to be paid back. They still have the same kind of mentality when they're looking at engagement with global affairs. So what would a Chinese leadership, a, a, a Chinese top dog, as you put it, Steve, look like? If well, it doesn't I mean, look like the, Chinese, the US. What the Chinese government would like is, in fact, to allow the Americans to continue to be the top, the top dog globally uh, in the foreseeable future, and for the Americans to carry the cane for all the problems that actually still happened, and yet for them to substantially increase their influence over the UN and other international agencies so that they, by and large, uh, take decisions which are not objectionable to China, but let the Americans and others pay the price for sorting out the problems that cannot be resolved. I see we've just lost Sharon there. I'm, I'm uh, hoping that she'll rejoin us. Thank you very much for that. Uh, um, this question is addressed to both you and, um, oh, there she is coming back, good. Uh, Anchor Shaw, who wants to know, uh, wants to hear you talk a little bit more about the Chinese government and disinformation. You mentioned that they very much admire President Putin. We've seen the Russians uh, try and manipulate the U.S. election through disinformation. How is China going to take that one step further? And, and, and are, are they going to take a page out of Russia's playbook to the extent that they we may see them trying to mess up the uh, U.S. elections this fall. I think. Do you want to start, Steve? I think I will make, make, make draw a line between um, misinformation campaigns and interference with uh, the electoral process. I have not seen the Chinese government uh, seriously attempting to interfere with the electoral process, whether we are talking about the United States or elsewhere. I mean, the only place that they kind of attempt to uh, influence electoral result is Taiwan, and incredibly unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but Taiwan is a special case for them. So I, I wouldn't see that as a template for elsewhere. The misinformation campaign is quite simply that just claim and shout very loud, loudly your particular case, whether you have evidence or not. Let the other side to come up with evidence to prove that you, you are wrong. And since nobody will dare to say that you lied anyway, it is going to be a very, very difficult thing to prove. And in any event, by the time they can marshal the evidence and uh, come up with a credible argument, the agenda will have moved on. People will have forgotten about it. So it doesn't really matter anyway. I think they, they, they saw the Russians as being rather effective and able to do that. 
and it's something which I think they would be quite happy if they can uh, achieve themselves. And we have seen that with the way how they present the narrative of the origins of COVID-19 and by insisting that there cannot be an independent international investigation into the origins of COVID-19. But it would be actually all right to have the WHO lead uh, investigations into the how COVID-19 is being handled without looking at the origins of it, of course. That leads me to ask you, what, what's your, uh, what convinces you? Where did COVID-19 come from? Me. It's a bit of an unfair question, but yeah, I'd like to know what your opinion is. And well, all of you actually. Well, Steve, my view is quite sim simply that it almost certainly yeah. happened in China. There's no evidence to suggest that it did not originate in China and probably in, in Wuhan. But beyond that, we really don't know enough as to whether it came from uh, natural mutations or whether it was a leak from a lab. Um, there's not enough evidence to rule anything out or rule anything in specifically as the most convincing explanations. I think that is exactly why we should have a genuinely independent investigation and ascertain the real origins of it. What do the people in China? Um, I mean, I think that people do think that it did come from Wuhan. I mean, it is very difficult to find any evidence that it originated elsewhere. I think the idea that it was created is not, you know, has like no one really thinks that. Um, I also don't think that there's any evidence of that. Um, actually, the idea that it leaked from the lab was really popular on Chinese social media before the US, you know, started making that accusation. Um, you know, people were sharing articles about previous lab accidents and, and things like that. So I think it, it was kind of after that when the propaganda machine kicked in and was saying that the U.S. is accusing China of all these things that um, people started saying that that wasn't the case. Um, but like Steve said, I mean, it's really difficult to know what to think because there's just not enough evidence to to know where it really originated. And I actually think a probe now would also be very difficult to come, it would be very difficult to come to a conclusion. The Wall Street Journal did this great story about, um, you know, how they disinfected the market and took all the samples away. So I don't really see how any, a probe would be able to find the source of the virus anyway. Well, I think also with American politicians uh, making claims for compensation, um, I, I, you know, for the for the pandemic, we are never going to know the origin of the virus because you know it's now too highly politicized and contentious, and it's just not going to happen, unfortunately. We are getting close to the end of the session. It's gone like the wind. You're also very interesting. Um, I I would like to ask a question of my own now, and that we all know that President Putin. Uh, wanted President Trump to win the last election, and in fact, had tried to put his thumb on the scales there. Steve's already told us he doesn't think Chinese will put any thumbs on the scales in November, but what does, who does the party want to win, and why? Do you wanna start out, Isabel? <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> certainly, I think last time around, they were rather intrigued by Trump, and they did not like Hillary Clinton. So I think they may, have been misled by the thought that Trump would have to normalize, if you like, in office uh, when he didn't. I think they find it, look, it's difficult. In many ways, Trump has just made so many opportunities for China with his behavior. He's you know, attacked all of the United States alliances. He's reduced the United States influence in the world. Uh, its reputation, you know, he's dragging its reputation through the mud. That's all very good for China. It makes China look better. And remember Xi Jinping turning up in Davos just after the election saying, relax, global elite, China's here, we're, you know, we're still with you, uh, stay calm, it's all going to be fine. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a very easy win for China. China's, as I said earlier, messed it up a little since. Um, I think, and this is, I have no evidence either way, my guess is that they're a little weary of Trump, but I may be projecting my own 
<laughs> weariness onto the People's Republic. Um, but you know, the, you, unpredictability is useful up to a point, and and I think that it. I don't think they have so much, but his his policy may be a little less irrational. Yeah. We say. So I think they may be back in Biden. I have no idea. You? I what, did this one of the very few things that I disagree with uh, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, 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 I think the Chinese actually prefer Trump. And I don't, I don't find it very difficult for them to prefer Trump to Biden. Um, even though the, um, the Biden family potentially would look like easy pick easy picking for them in terms of uh, inference patterning. But the issue there here really is that you have such a structural change in the US policy making establishments in their, in their attitude towards China, that a change in administration in Washington is not going to have a basic reversal of the Trumpist uh, approach to China. The implementation would be different, but the direction of travel is not going to be different. So a normal president in the White House is going to be much more difficult to deal with than an erratic one who still treats Xi Jinping as his good friend. And he is still unwilling to be saying anything that is offensive to Xi Jinping in contrast to China. Trump's perfectly happy to trash China, but he would not do that to Xi Jinping. This is something which I think the uh, Chinese government see huge value in. And of course, there's also that wonderful Trumpian uh, capacity to put foot in the mouth and destroy American credibility uh, globally and destroy American capacity to do the right things in the world. That's my view. Sharon, do you want to take a run at that? And I, I'm also interested to know whether the Chinese business community might uh, ha have a, a sort of consensus on who would be best for them in the White House. Um, I think I have to agree with Isabel. I think the Chinese would prefer Biden. I get the argument that, you know, well, firstly, it's better the evil you know, and secondly, if you have a weak opponent, you look better in comparison. But I think the... Uh, the trade war especially and this escalation of US-China tensions, um, you know, the chances that it really gets out of hand, especially if Trump is in the second term, um, is, is kind of a risk that China probably doesn't want to have to deal with. And, you know, like we were talking about on Hong Kong, you know, the standoff, both sides are facing domestic pressure, like it, push, it could push either side to take really extreme action that would require a, a reciprocal response. And I don't think China really wants to do that, but then it would be pushed to do that if they were facing kind of a more and more erratic and desperate leader in the US side. Um, so I think there are benefits for having a, a switch back to that traditional kind of reliable relationship where at least the roads of the rule, the rules of the road are known. Um, but I do agree that no matter who wins, it's still going to be a very hard line on China and relations are going to continue to get worse and China's prepared for that. I think they, they know that that's the case no matter what. I think the business community would probably also prefer Biden just because of the, there'll be more predictability, you know, markets wouldn't be so volatile, like there wouldn't be so many kind of unexpected changes to rules and regulations and and you know these things that can really just like you wake up in the morning and everything is down and you know some unpredictable thing happened overnight so i think businesses would prefer a more like easy to telegraph policy making process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to you and Grant to take us back to Wolf Warrior diplomacy and so on. Um, he asks, uh, it first appeared in 2015, given that China is facing uh, some economic problems and certainly uncertainty in its uh, main rival, the United States, is there any indication uh, that big Chinese companies or the party itself 
now think they overreacted in the aggression of Wolf Warrior, and they're, they're trying to massage their way out of it. They're trying to ease the trade and technology disagreements. Steve, what do you think? There are a good number of people in the Chinese establishment who do not approve of Wolf Warrior diplomacy. Um, they understand the issues. There are plenty of very, very smart people in the Chinese government and in the business world. They really understand what's going on in the rest of the world. They know that is not going to be enough to change the policy set by Xi Jinping, who in the Politburo or the Politburo Standing Committee is going to say to Xi Jinping that with the greatest respect, General Secretary, your policy is just causing us the future. Please just ease off a bit. Um, just don't do anything more for, for, for a bit, not for very long. You sign your political death warrant. You, you're not going to do that. So I don't really see a lot of that potentially happening. I also see that there is a basic change in the way how the Chinese political system is functioning. In the post Deng Xiaoping world, it was collective leadership with a lot of internal policy debates uh, within the party. Now you have a strong man leader. It's no longer collective leadership. The strong is taking China to the promised land. He cannot be wrong. He cannot afford to be wrong. He cannot afford to admit that wolf warrior diplomacy which come into place because of his robust stance and his call to Chinese uh, government officials to unshield their soul is bringing in negative results for the country. It cannot be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Close to the end. Um, I, I think we, as Steve says it's really important to remember the role of nationalism in the internal narrative and that's narrowing Xi, Jin, Xi Jinping's space you know it's very hard to make concessions to the outside world if that's your story and it's been a story it's been building as a story there are critics including the former ambassador to the UK Fu Ying who the other day said you know not sure about this wolf warrior stuff but it's an audience of one as Steve says there have been some more friendly noises towards foreign companies and foreign investments which came out of the National People's Congress that we've just had. But I think that's unrelated. I think that's more to do with concern about incoming investment and China's need for, you know, continuing need for, for FDI um, and to make some concession to this, you know, to this continuing demands for a, a more level playing field. They're relatively small, and I don't think they're to mm -hmm. do with Wolf Warrior diplomacy. Okay, so one quick, uh, very last thing, because we, we really are running out of time, but should the UK get out of uh, its relationship with Huawei? Sharon, you go first. You can just have yes or no or no comment. <laughs> um, I mean, probably yes. I don't know if you okay. will. <laughs> Steve? We should not ask our um, telecom companies to strip out the existing Huawei infrastructures in place, but those are for 4G. For 5G, which is a critical infrastructure, I think we really need to think very, very hard to install new installations. From new no. suppliers? In new supplies, in new yeah. infrastructure. Non-Huawei, thank you. Isabel? Uh, I, I don't disagree, um, but I would say this is the UK in the uncomfortable position of de declaring itself a kind of uh, a new global player uh, post-Brexit, uh, just at the moment when US and China are <laughs> engaged in a very fierce um, contest. And as I wrote a couple of years back, seeing this thing develop you know when elephants fight the grass gets trampled and we are the grass <laughs> on that note i want to thank you all very much i've learned a great deal and i see on the the, the list of questions uh, many people saying thank you thank you thank you so much for your insight and your comments i echo, echo that and uh, i wish you uh, well and um 
uh, on behalf of the Frontline Club, uh, what a pleasure to have you. Bye-bye.